devastating. Why don't we cut it? The motion is not adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The question is on adoption of the conference report. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The conference. Mr. Speaker. For what purpose does the, the gentleman. On that vote, I request a recorded vote. The ayes and nays. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five minute vote. This is the final vote in this chamber on the $662 billion House-Senate compromise on defense programs for 2012. The measure authorizes money for military personnel, weapon systems, uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and national security programs at the Energy Department. The Senate plans to wrap up work on the compromise tomorrow, if passed here in the House, and then send it to President Obama. After this vote, the House will debate four remaining bills, any roll call votes will be postponed.
Mr. Ellison votes no. On this vote, the yeas are 283 and the nays are 136. The conference report is adopted. Without objection, motion to reconsider is laid on the table. What purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? The desk a concurrent resolution and ask unanimous consent for its immediate consideration in the House. The clerk will report the title of the concurrent resolution. House Concurrent Resolution 92, concurrent resolution directing the clerk of the House of Representatives to correct the enrollment of the bill H.R. 1540. Is there an objection to the consideration of the concurrent resolution? Without objection, the concurrent resolution is agreed to and the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Okay. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Madam Speaker, I send to the desk a concurrent resolution providing for a correction in the enrollment of the bill H.R. 2845 and ask unanimous consent for its immediate consideration in the House. The clerk will report the title of the concurrent resolution. House Concurrent Resolution 93, concurrent resolution providing for a correction to the enrollment of the bill, H.R. 2845. Is there objection to the consideration of the concurrent resolution? Without objection, the concurrent resolution is agreed to and the motion to, re to reconsider is laid on the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the Chair will postpone further, consider further proceedings today on motions to suspend the rules on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered or on which the vote incurs objection under Clause 6 of Rule 20. Record votes on postponed questions will be taken later. For what purpose does this gentleman from Washington seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 443 as amended. Uh, the clerk will read the title of the bill. Union calendar number 216, H.R. 443, a bill to provide for the conveyance of certain property from the United States to the Money Luck Association located in Kotzebue, Alaska. Uh, pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, and the gentleman from uh, the Northern Marianas Islands, Mr. Sadlon, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Mr. Speaker, I ask for now's consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend the remarks and include extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Ordered.
Do you propose to pass the bill as amended? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I just ask unanimous consent that all members have five legis Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, with that, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentlemen, we'll suspend one moment, please. I'm sorry. The gentleman may proceed. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, H.R. 443 is sponsored by our colleague from Alaska, Mr. Young. The legislation directs the Indian Health Service to transfer three parcels of federal land in Alaska in the Malilek, uh, to the, to the Manilek Association. The association is a nonprofit entity that runs federal Indian health services for native people in northwest Alaska. The parcels of land subject to this legislation, which totals about 15 acres, are currently the site of the existing native health facility and of proposed long-term care facilities and employee housing. The subject lands have already been conveyed by the Secretary to the association through a quit claim de deed. The federal Indian health laws, however, uh, under these laws, transferring the land through the use of a quit claim deed could present some obstacles to the future use of the land by the association. H.R. 443 addresses this problem by directing the Secretary to convey the property through the use of a warranty deed. This method provides clean title to the land. The administration testified in support of the land transfer, and we have heard no other objection to this bill. The bill was referred to the Committee on Energy and Commerce. The chairman of that committee, Mr. Upton, has kindly foregone action on the bill in the interest of expediting consideration on the House floor, and I thank him for his cooperation. And at this point, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to include on the record the exchange of letters between our committees regarding this bill. So ordered. Without objection. With that, Mr. Speaker, I urge the House to pass the bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Washington Reserves. Gentle gentleman from Marianas Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. So ordered, without objection. I yield myself as much time as make, I may consume. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 443. This bill would provide the Manilac Association with clear title to land previously conveyed to it by the United States. Elimination of this restriction would enable the association to obtain loans for improvements to the property without federal involvement. I ask my colleagues to support the passage of this legislation and I reserve the balance of my time. Without objection. Gentleman reserves, gentleman from Washington. Mr. Speaker, I am very pleased to yield as much time as he may consume to the author of this legislation, the gentleman from Alaska, Mr. Young. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I want to thank you, Chairman Hastings, and the ranking member for your cooperation in moving this bill. As you said in your explanation, this is a non-controversial bill, solves the problem for the health providers of that area in Kotzebue, and I urge the final passage to yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Marianas Islands. Mr. Speaker, I yield, my, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, urge the support of the bill and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields. Washington has yielded back. Yeah. Yeah. Question is will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 443 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, those opposed no. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I object to the vote on the grounds that a quorum is not present and make a point of order that a quorum is not present. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. For what purposes does the gentleman from Washington seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2719. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Union calendar number 219, H.R. 2719. 
a bill to ensure public access to the summit of Rattlesnake Mountain in, ha in the Hanford Reach National Monument for educational, recreational, historical, scientific, cultural, and other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, and the gentleman from the North Marianas Islands, Mr. Splon, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask now his consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, H.R. 2719 directs the Department of Interior to ensure public access to the summit of Rattlesnake Mountain located on the Hanford Reach National Monument in my district. At 3,600 feet, Rattlesnake Mountain is the highest point in the region and it provides unparalleled views for miles around the monument of the Hanford site, the Columbia River, the Yakima River, and the Snake River. Unfortunately, it took the Fish and Wildlife Service eight years to write a management plan that effectively closed Rattlesnake Mountain to public access, despite the public comments favoring just the opposite. After I introduced this bill last Congress, the Fish and Wildlife Service in October, 10th, uh, October of 2010 offered two public tours for selected individuals and then suddenly reneged on the offer just days before the tours were to occur without any explanation. During a recent committee hearing on the bill, the Interior Department's testimony suggested that the Fish and Wildlife Service supports tours of Rattlesnake Mountain, but very carefully didn't go the extra step of ensuring that the service would allow public access to the actual summit. Access to the mountain and access to the summit are two entirely different matters. To put it bluntly, Mr. Speaker, the service has had more than 10 years, and they say will it will take several more before they can determine if it will allow the American people to have access to this portion of the monument. That is why this bill is so necessary to, to guarantee public access by law and to do so in a very timely manner. And Mr. Speaker, I might add, the tallest mountain in Washington State is Mount Rainier, 14,410 feet. People have access up to that under certain conditions. This is a mountain that has no trees. It's 3,600 feet. Uh, there's no reason why people shouldn't have access. And to that extent, the legislation is supported by the Tri-Cities Development Council, the Board of Benton County Commissioners, in which Rattlesnake Mountain is located, the Tri-City Regional Chamber of Commerce, the Tri-Cities Visitor and Convention Bureau, and the Backcountry Horsemen of Washington. The American people deserve to have access to public lands, including Rattlesnake Mountain. And I ask that the House pass this reasonable legislation to do today to make it possible. I note that the bill was reported by the Committee on Natural Resources by unanimous consent, and I appreciate the support of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for this measure. And with that, I urge my colleagues to support the bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from North Marianas Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 2179, which would require the Fish and Wildlife Service to provide both motorized and non-motorized access to the summit of Rattlesnake Mountain. This bill would allow the Fish and Wildlife Service to enter into cooperative agreements with the Department of Energy, the State of Washington, local governments, and other interested persons to provide guided tours to the summit of the mountain and to maintain access uh, road to the summit. In 2008, the Fish and Wildlife Service completed a management plan for this area and determined that service-sponsored or led tours and a hiking trail are appropriate and compatible, compatible uses of the area. In October, at the hearing of, on H.R. 2719, the Fish and Wildlife Service supported the bill's intent to provide appropriate public access on Rattlesnake Mountain that gives due consideration to all stakeholders, including the Yakima tribe. I commend Chairman Hastings from Washington for introducing this, his bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I asked my friend uh, from the Northern Marianas if he has any more speakers. I have none, and I'm prepared to yield back if he is. Mr. Speaker, I have no further speakers, and I yield back my, the balance of my time. Gentleman. Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I urge uh, uh, my colleagues to support this bill, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time.
question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2719? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. I'm sorry. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. Sir. Suspending the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the... Ms. Speaker, I object to the vote on the grounds that a quorum is not present and make a point of order that a quorum is not present. Yes, sir. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Gentleman from Washington. Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass S-278 as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Senate 278, an act to provide for the exchange of certain land located in the Arapaho Roosevelt National Forests in the state of Colorado and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, and the gentleman from uh, the Northern Marianas Islands, Mr. Sblon, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative, legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. So ordered. Mr. Speaker, S-278 will exchange approximately five acres of land between the Forest Service and the Sugarloaf Fire Protection District in Colorado. The district has operated two fire stations on forest land since 1967, but has been unable to install septic services or make other improvements to the fire stations since it does not own the land. This bill would correct this issue by conveying the lands to the district in exchange for an inholding in currently owns within the Arapaho uh, Roosevelt National Forest at no cost to the federal government. The Committee on Natural Resources has already favorably reported the House version of this bill, H.R. 643, and if we pass this bill, the bill will go to the President's desk. So with that, I urge adoption of the measure and reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from North Marion is silent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Thank Speaker, you myself have so much time as I have consumed. So ordered. Mr. Speaker, since 1967, the Forest Service has issued two special use permits to the Sugarloaf Fire Protection District to own and operate two fire stations on National Forest System land. The district would like to own the parcels of land on which the fire stations sit in order to build an area for firefighter training and bathroom facilities. The land exchange authorized in this legislation will assist the fire district in its mission and is in the public interest. Mr. Speaker, Congressman Poole is sponsored the House Companion to this legislation, H.R. 643. We commend Congressman Poole for his work on this bill and we support passage of this measure. And I reserve the balance of my time. General Reserves. Mr. Speaker, I reserve my time. General Thank Reserves. You. Mr. Speaker, I, I wish to you, I will you as much time as, as he may consume to the House sponsor of this measure, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, I thank the gentleman, and I uh, rise today uh, to provide a description and some color for this important bill, which passed this body uh, last session in the 111th Congress without any objection and uh, did not make it through the Senate last session. Well, I'm proud to say that since that point, Senate Bill 278 has cleared the Senate. It's a companion to my bill, H.R. 643. Uh, there are some minor changes to comply with House rules that are uh, going to be sent back to the Senate, and we sure hope that expeditiously we can get this bill to President Obama's desk. Um, but it is very simple and non-controversial what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, it's the result of a long time effort far too long by the Sugarloaf Fire Protection District in Sugarloaf, Colorado. Uh, this fire protection district uh, came to national notice for their heroic efforts uh, in the Four Mile Canyon fire uh, last year, which remarkably, uh, while led to considerable property damage, led to uh, no loss of life, thanks in no small part uh, to their heroic efforts. Sugarloaf Fire Protection District and the U.F. Forest Service have always worked together very closely since the fire district was created in 1967. Uh, the volunteer first responders at the Sugarloaf Fire Protection District are the key to both wildland and residential uh, fires 
in Boulder County, as well as car accidents and health emergencies in the communities and public lands that they so capably serve. Uh, however, until this bill becomes law, uh, they're unable to make any uh, improvements to their facility. They can't even add a uh, much-needed restroom uh, facility so that their volunteers uh, can have the same type of plumbing that uh, we can expect in this day and age. Uh, in, in its start, again, since 1967, the fire district's physical home was established in an existing building on U.S. Forest Service land, land through a special use permit. Three years later, a second building was constructed, another special use permit, uh, both in important locations for accessibility on the few main roads that serve this mountainous area. This bill will exchange a small amount of federal land on which these facilities exist with private land that's been purchased by the fire district for this transfer, land that's better suited for the scenic and recreational needs of the local public lands. It's a net gain for our federal government. While the U.S. Forest Service and these special use permits have been greatly appreciated over the 40-year history, it's important that the fire district has the autonomy to direct its future, modernize its facilities, build basic amenities like running water and, and restrooms. Uh, and their, their location on public land has precluded them from making these uh, modernizations uh, which we need to better protect both our wildlands and residential areas. Uh, the surrounding communities have grown considerably over the past decades um, and, and these uh, volunteer fire departments and the buildings that serve them have taken on additional responsibilities as community meeting centers making it even more critical that we are update them um, to facilitate this role. Um, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate Chairman Hastings and Ranking Members Markey's efforts in bringing this bill to the floor, uh, hopefully seeing this bill through uh, to law soon. This bill has been passed out of both chambers of Congress now, but just hasn't been able to make it past the finish line within a single Congress in one form, uh, barely running out of time in the Senate last year. Uh, by the House agreeing to take up the Senate bill, I'm confident and thankful that this common sense bill will finally become law. Again, I thank Chairman Hastings and Ranking Member Markey for bringing this bill to the floor. I urge a yes vote on this measure, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields. Gentleman from Washington. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I just uh, note to my uh, friend from Colorado, he said that the uh, bill passed the House last year and the Senate didn't act on it. I think it's a very good strategy on his part to take a Senate bill. Uh, now, we, of course, have to perfect it, but we'll send it back, and maybe, maybe this will be easier for them to, to act. I certainly hope so. With that, I urge passage of the bill, and, and I advise my friend that I am prepared to yield back if he yields back. Gentleman yields. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Um, I have no further speakers, and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Washington. Mr. Speaker, I urge the adoption uh, of this bill, and I yield back my time. Chairman yields. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass Senate Bill 278 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Speaker. Gentleman from Washington. Mr. Speaker, I object to the bill on the grounds that a quorum is not present make a point of order that a quorum is not present. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. The unfinished business is the question on suspending the rules and passing H.R. 2668, which, which the clerk will report by title. House Calendar Number 98, H.R. 2668, a bill to designate the station of the United States Border Patrol located at 2136 South Naco Highway in Bisbee, Arizona, as the Brian A. Terry Border Patrol Station. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? So many as are in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table.
The chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Diaz Ballard of Florida for today and through Friday, December 16th. Without objection, the request is granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Corder, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 13 adults and one unborn child were killed and 31 individuals wounded in a shooting attack at Fort Hood, Texas on November the 5th, 2009. Since that time, the Department of Defense has taken no steps to award combat benefits to the casualties or even officially recognize the attack as a terrorist incident. The House and Senate have included two reform measures in the NDAA, which we just passed, and all, all while additional attacks have been attempted by similar high-profile radical Islamic terrorists. In the past, it is past time for the government to deliver on this act. Mr. Speaker, here we are almost three years later, I guess three years later, and, a, and a, there's been a recent report that has come out, and in that report, it, re it references this incident of this slaughter of American troops on Fort Hood soil in Texas, and it references that it shall be taken up as part of workplace violence. Obama regime calls Fort Hood shooting workplace violence. Sure, it's workplace violence. It's where he works, it's violence. But we have a concept of what workplace place violence is. And the, your normal workplace violence is not preceded by a shout by the shooter, God is great. In, in, in the Arabic language. It's not preceded by discussions by the alleged perpetrator, and it's alleged because he hasn't been convicted yet, and we in a free American world take the position that all, all are innocent until proven guilty, so we will call him the alleged shooter. But there's clear evidence in reports by the Defense Department and by reports by the news media, reports by witnesses on the scene, reports by his fellow soldiers, reports by folk, folks that from Walter Reed Ross Hospital where this American trained, military trained doctor worked, that he had advocated that, w that the American soldier was wrong and that he was contrary and he spoke and preached Islamic terrorism. So your normal workplace violence, that, that's not a part of the factor. And yet, this is what happened in this case. Senator Collins on Wednesday blasted the Defense Department, and bless her for it, for, character, for classifying the Fort Hood massacre as workplace violence and suggested political correctness is being placed above the security of the nation's 
armed forces at home. Now, I've been talking about this now since the day after this happened. We can't have a world where political correctness fails to define the criminal act. By its very nature, whether we're talking about military law and the criminal relations in military law, or we're just talking about criminal acts in general, they have to have, we have to be able to define them. Just to make the system work, we have to be able to define them. But more importantly, we owe a duty and a responsibility to the American soldier to call an event what it is and not try to put smokescreen over it or cloud the issue or in any way worry about the feelings of, of, of groups that, because the definition is the definition. This man identified himself that he was committing this act in the name of God is great in Arabic. He acknowledged to the Quinn question that it was part of his mission. He acknowledged that he had that he had dealt with terrorist spokesmen in the past and that the concept came from his internet interaction with Amaliki and others. I think that's the guy's name. So, you know, this this guy is this guy is an Islamic terrorist. There's no other way you can de describe this gentleman. But we continue. Now, years after the event, as he sits in the Bell County Jail in, Bel in Belton, Texas, we continue to have reports coming down from our Defense Department, the, the, the folks that are responsible for our soldiers and responsible for those who died in this incident, to downplay this to be treated as an instant of workplace violence with all the white bread connotation that that has. It, it's, just, it's just, to me, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Let's get the next poster up here. So let's look at the, uh, some of the evidence we have that connects, whoops, my bad, that connects this to Islamic terrorism. Recognizing the November 5, 2009 attack on Fort Hood, uh, Texas, as an act of radical Islamic terrorism and jihad, Anwar Awaliki connection. Now, Mr. Awaliki is no longer with us. We have taken that boy out. But the bottom line was, at the time this happened, they were directly connected, and this man preached, taught, and encouraged violence. Islamic terrorist violence. Hassan's presentations of the DOG, DOD on jihad justification. He would, he would argue with his fellow soldiers about the justification for the reason for having jihad against the American military. Mr. Hassan was a member of the United States Army. He was a major. He had been serving in, as, in the medical corps as a doctor, a, psych, a psychologist and psychiatrist. He was trained with American taxpayer dollars, and he was preaching jihad to soldiers. And there was lots of evidence. We, one of the bills that we, one of the, the, I had a bill which was included in this recent uh, defense bill that we just passed, which said that, that, that this guy was telling people that he was, that, that he believed in this kind of thing from medical school. And now he's a major serving as a psycho psychiatrist advising our soldiers. Hassan purchased purchase of a and practiced with a high capacity firearms prior to the attack. He went out and he bought firearms. He bought them at a local gun store. Uh, both the guns that were used in the in the killing, one of them 
a semi-automatic weapon with a large magazine capacity. Uh, he went out to the firing range and familiarized himself with these weapons prior to this incident. You can't think of this as some guy that goes postal all of a sudden. This guy was planning this whole event. He shouts, God is great in Arabic when he's, before he starts shooting. And now they refer to it in the context of the broader threat of workplace place violence. I think there's a very good argument that the evidence shows this was a premeditated act on the part of Major Hassan. And I believe when this case finally gets to trial that the evidence will be overwhelming that it was premeditated. At the time of the event, uh, General Cohn, the base commander, actually three corps commander, uh, at Fort Hood says the soldiers who witnessed the shooting rampage that left 13 people dead reported that the government shouted Allah Akbar, before that, which is God, that means God is great, opening fire, before opening fire at the Texas Post. The Lieutenant General said, told NBC News Today Show on Friday after the shooting, uh, that the suspected shoot, shooter, Major Nidal Mal Malak Hassan, made the comment, which is Arabic for God is great, before the rampage and shooting on Thursday. So the day after, it was being reported that he did this. And yet the initial report that came out from the, from the Defense Department took the position that you never even heard, the, the man's name didn't even appear in the report. The relationship to any Islamic terrorism was not referenced. It was like any major from any outfit just wandered in and started shooting soldiers. Uh, and like it just, yeah, it was having a bad day or something. And now we, now we get another comment saying, we're going to treat this in the bigger scope of workplace violence. Certainly, we're going to, we want to prevent workplace violence in every workplace. But the connotation is that this is just something that happened. And it's not something that, that happened because, quite honestly, since that time, others have been caught and reportedly were acting, trying to imitate this shooter, Mr. Hassan. Uh, We've, we've introduced a bill, the Fort Hood Families Benefits Protection Act. It would award both military and civilian casualties of the Fort Hood attack with combat status to ensure full benefits and eligibility for the Purple Heart and other awards and for the civilian award equivalents, the Secretaries of Defense Medal Defense of Freedom, which is the civilian equivalents. Now, why did I ask for that? Because there was a precedent for it. When they flew the plane into the Pentagon on 9-11, this is what was the finding of the Department of Defense, that it was an act of terrorism, and therefore it sh they should be treated as combat casualties, and those two medals were awarded. I mean, I didn't, this didn't just come out of the top of my head. This is what happened with the first terrorist attack in our country. And the second or third or whatever attack this one was, when this man walked into that room, there were people in civilian garb and there were people in uniform. He went out of his way to shoot the people in the uniforms. And the civilians that were injured were injured because of misfire or misdirection. But his target, as he walked down that line of all those soldiers who were doing nothing more than either coming back from being, being off post and, and out of the country or wherever they've been, or being prepared for their next duty station, wherever they may have be going, Iraq or Af Afghanistan, they were being processed, and they're in this big room. He walked down the line, shooting everybody in uniform. Now, when you're, at, when you're killing our combat soldiers, you're crying out slogans of, a, of the jihad terrorists, why wouldn't you think it's a terrorist attack, and why shouldn't these people who died in the line of duty be treated like 
those at the Pentagon who died in the line of duty. And in fact, except for what we, we were able to put together in circumstantial evidence after the fact, at the time of the incident, we had no idea who flew that plane into the Pentagon. We just had an educated guess. In this case, before this shooting started, the guy identified himself and what his mission was. And yet, for some reason, in this world of political correctness, we feel like it seems to be some, someone has the idea that this is good for the morale of our military soldiers or it's good for something. Uh, as one, one, I think the chief of staff said when this happened, oh, this is sure going to hurt our, hurt our Islamic outreach program. Well, if it's good, whether it's good for that, that or not, I hold nothing against the Islamic people, nor do any, does anybody in Fort Hood. But we hold a lot against Islamic terrorists that kill soldiers. And we should have, the whole Department of Defense should have the guts to step up and stand up for these soldiers. I see my good friend and colleague from Texas, uh, former Judge Louis Gohmert, has joined me here. Congressman Gohmert, I'll yield you such time as you may require. And I thank my friend, and I appreciate uh is taking time to discuss this matter of uh, national security. I have the quote directly here from um, Army Chief of Staff General George W. Casey, Jr., um, Chief of Staff at the time of the Fort Hood attack. Uh, he came out and had this prepared quote to give. He's actually and chief, chief of, he was Chief of Staff of the Army. Chief of Staff of the Army. Correct. And this is a quote that obviously he and those helping him had prepared to give in response to 14 people being killed. We know one was an unborn child. One of the people was a uh, pregnant woman, a female soldier. But uh, here's, here's the quote that they had prepared after 13 of his soldiers lay either dying or dead at Fort Hood. Quote, I'm concerned that this increased speculation could cause a backlash against some of our Muslim soldiers. Our diversity, not only in our army, but in our country is a strength and has, as horrific as this tragedy was, if our diversity becomes a casualty, I think that's worse. This is a general who is charged with leading soldiers and directing soldiers in war and in battle with a, an avowed enemy. Well, we have an enemy who has sworn to be at war with us. And one of those enemies was Major Hassan at Fort Hood that went off in a shooting spree. Now, unfortunately, uh, our leaders did not bother to monitor the security of our own soldiers such that when Major Hassan made actual pronouncements in advance that he could not... Uh, be deployed and be a Muslim because in his interpretation of the Quran, thankfully it's not all of our Muslim soldiers in the U.S. military that have this in interpretation, but his interpretation was that he could not be deployed because that might require him to kill Muslims in, in a foreign country without cause and under the beliefs of uh, some Muslims, like Major Hassan, if he were to kill a Muslim without cause, for example, in his way of thinking, it is appropriate cause, say, if a Muslim were to become a Christian, then that is a cause, in his mind, worthy of killing the individual if they created this horrible uh, crime in his mind, uh, according to the Quran, of becoming a Christian, that's worth killing him for. But since he couldn't be sure that in a foreign country 
uh, in a battle with Muslims that he might not be required to shoot someone who had not committed apostasy, had not committed some act that justified uh, murder under the Quran, then he could not be deployed. And if he were deployed, he'd have to kill American soldiers to avoid having to go kill uh, soldiers overseas. And it's interesting because you would think that the military would be concerned about this issue and that we would try to make sure that this incident as happened at Fort Hood, would not happen again. And so, you would think that when this private showed up on Al Jazeera in uniform and told Al Jazeera basically the same things that Major Hassan had, that people like General Casey would be concerned. But apparently he was more concerned about our diversity than he was about the lives of his own soldiers. And so when you had this private on Al Jazeera, and it's not hard, you can go online and find this uh, on YouTube, his interview, uh, he spoke in English, but Al Jazeera, um, the story was done actually uh, in the language that Al Jazeera prefers, and it's not English, he explained basically what Major Hassan did, that he could not be, as, as it says, uh, I, uh, and that's an Al Jazeera uh, line there, I can't both deploy and be a Muslim. And we have the transcript of, of what he said, the transcript of the story, but basically he was letting people like General Casey that would bother to worry about the, well, not General Casey because he's worried about the diversity and the safety of his soldiers is secondary to that. But for those who are concerned, number one, about the safety of those in this country and making sure that their own soldiers are tantamount uh, in their minds, they would be concerned when you have another soldier saying the same things Major Hassan did before the killing spree. So we know that there are people in our special ops, in our uh, military that noted this, that saw this, that said this is a guy we'd better watch. But because the people at the top are more concerned about diversity than they are about our soldiers' safety, I mean, it's bad enough that they put their lives on the line. They're willing to do that in combat. But you would think that they, there would be more concern for their own safety and their own units. Nothing was done about this private. And despite this Justice Department trying to vilify gun dealers who it forced into making sales to criminals who carried guns across the border, and despite the efforts that were made to maybe, and in fact, there were even uh, names were produced, pictures were produced of gun dealers out of the Fast and Furious thing. Um, despite that, it was actually not General Casey, not one of his subordinates, not one of our own people in the military that reported this guy. No, it was Nothing was done, even though they knew he was ready to pull a major assign, he could not be deployed. Nothing was done. And it was not until he went to a gun dealer, the gun dealer became suspicious, the gun dealer reported him. Thank God for Amer Americans like that gun dealer who realized we got our own soldiers' lives at stake here. He reported him, and then locally he was, he was dealt with and interdiction occurred, and he was not given the chance to kill the soldiers he wanted to again at Fort Hood. Because if it weren't for the gun dealer and those intervening, not the military, not our intelligence, who surely monitor Al Jazeera and would surely note a soldier in uniform with the screaming eagle patch on his arm, that this is something we need to worry about. But because we have become so politically correct, 
to the detriment and death of our own soldiers, nothing was done from intelligence, from state, from justice. It took a local gun dealer to protect our soldiers at Fort Hood. And you wonder how many more times this is going to have to happen. Heck, um... This, this soldier, you can go on Facebook and you could find uh, that he notes his activities and interests, CARE, the Council of um, American Israeli um, or Islamic group there. CARE is, is named in the Holy Land Foundation trial as a co-conspirator, there was evidence produced that showed that CARE was also funding terrorism. CARE, funding terrorism, funding Hamas, participating in that venture with Holy Land Foundation as found by the Fifth Circuit when they refused to eliminate CARE's name from those pleadings. He identifies CARE as one of his interests and activities and our intelligence, our military, they didn't pick up on that. Why? Because that would be politically incorrect and might hurt our diversity. We've got outstanding Muslim soldiers in our military serving that love and care about this country like all other soldiers. But it is insane, and I believe a violation of the commitment and oath that every officer takes like I did when I went in the military, not to keep your eyes open and protect those people who are put to your service as your charges. So here he is, Nasser Abdu. He um, went on Al Jazeera. He makes it clear he may have to kill American soldiers. He cannot allow himself to be deployed as a Muslim. Um, he requested conscientious objector status, and all we can do is thank God for the gun dealer that did what the superiors should have done in this case. It's time to end political correctness when it costs the lives of those protecting us. And I'll yield back to my friend. And I thank you for yielding back. I, uh, reclaiming my time, you know, when you read the reports on Major Hassan, he was acting erratically in the months before the attack. He promoted radical Islamic views while at Walter Reed Hospital. He exchanged emails with Anwar Awalaki, a Yemen cleric with terrorist ties. All of those references pertain to the, also the soldiers you were talking about right there. They're, it's all part of a network. Now, is every uh, Muslim that's involved in the United States military involved in this? Absolutely not. I went to the National Training Center in California, and I met loyal, truly loyal and patriotic uh, Muslim Americans who are helping our soldiers understand the nature, the, the uh, mores, the language, uh, the concepts, everything that they might be facing as they interact with Muslim civilians uh, over in Iraq, and they do it in constructed villages that, where I met a guy who was a former cab driver from Chicago who said, man, I've come up in the world. I'm now mayor of this town. Because he was portraying negotiating with a mayor and city councilman for our soldiers as they came in to the National Training Center. These people are patriots. They're, they're living out in the desert just to help our soldiers understand. I'm not anti those folks, but you can't have a world where you refuse to identify evil. And this is what you do when political correctness overcomes the truth. Janet Napolitano personally testified violent Islamic terrorism was part and parcel of the Fort Hood killings. Homeland Security Napolitano said on February 24, 2010, about three months after the, the event, four months after the event, in a Senate Homeland Security Committee, she testified accurately, I would, and, and I praise her for it, that this was a terrorist act. And yet, we continue to have from the Department of Defense the soft-soaping 
of this whole issue and the disguising of this whole issue and now with their statement that they're going to deal with it as, as they would deal with any workplace violence. You know, it just never stops. The shoe bomber, the Christmas following this incident, the shoe bomber who did exactly what the major did, reading back what, his, what the press reported, acted erratically before the, his attack, promoted radically Islamic views, exchanged emails with Awalaki in Yemen, did all those things, he got, and when caught, referenced Major Hassan as one of his heroes, he got caught before he blew up an airplane. Praise God. Thank goodness. So, you know, to, for the now almost, well, th over three years since the incident, to have the Defense Department still taking the position that this should be treated as normal workforce violence or something to that effact. Well, Jim, and you. It, yes, I will you. 